Deciding which credit card or loan is right for you is like trying to choose where you want to eat for dinner. Except when you finally get to the restaurant, the menu is riddled with jargon that no average foodie could understand. So at Credit Karma, we keep things simple. We show you personalized recommendations that align with your money goals and help you turn the confusing fine print into terms you can actually understand. And as a cherry on top, we provide a detailed overview for a new card or loan before you apply. That way, we can help you make decisions faster and with more confidence. Download Intuit Credit Karma today to get started. Whether you're ordering wings for the game, whipping up a seven-layer dip, or ordering pizza, there's something about football that makes you want to eat. And this football season, Uber Eats has the best deals on game day food, no matter what you're craving. From two-for-one pizza to buy one, get one wings, Uber Eats will be dropping new deals each week, all season long. Uber Eats, official on-demand delivery partner of the NFL. Order now. Terms and conditions apply. See app for details. When I wake up, well, I know I'm going to be, I'm going to be the man who wakes up next to you. When I go out, yeah, I know I'm going to be, I'm going to be the man who goes along with you. Breaking news out of Norman the day after Oklahoma suffers a humiliating 35 to 9 defeat at the hands of South Carolina. Brent Venables pulls the trigger and ends the era of Seth Luttrell as Oklahoma's offensive coordinator. I think the fans have been done with him since probably the Houston. Houston, Yeah, the Houston game, you think? Um, but Brent Venables finally catches on and says goodbye to Seth Luttrell. Joe John Philly now the the play caller for Oklahoma's offense. I don't know that fans are as excited uh, about that as maybe they should be. Maybe they shouldn't be. I don't know. But clearly we have a lot to talk about, Caleb, on this episode of the Sooner Nation podcast. Yeah. Um, honestly, I didn't expect him to get fired. I thought if he was going to get fired this season, it would have came after that OU Texas game. But this offense just – they don't look to even be having signs of improvement. Mm-hmm. You can say it's on the offensive line. But, I mean, those first two turnovers, it wasn't the offensive line's responsibility that got through. It was the tight ends. Uh, it, and either way, it wasn't the tight end who fumbled the ball. It wasn't the tight end who threw the interceptions. I know the tight ends had a couple big drops and – couple missed big blocks, but it's just every week. I feel like this offense has taken a step backwards. Yeah. You know, first of all, I want to say this, if you've never done a podcast, it's not easy. And that's one of the things that we took a little bit of a hiatus. You know, I went through a life change and, um, Eric, just the, the planning and program that comes into doing these podcasts, it's not simple. And then you got to like map out your discussion points and all that stuff. And dude, I had just sent that to you for this episode of the podcast. And then you're like, just minutes later, I felt like you're like, oh yeah, here, look at this news. Seth Luttrell's about to get fired (laughs) at Oklahoma. And I'm like, everything's out the window now. Everything we had lined up to talk about pretty much is null and void in terms of the offensive performance against South Carolina. But I do believe, I I do believe South Carolina was the final straw. Now I, I'm going to, I was going to blow your mind if, if, because you have the original podcast lineup that I sent to you. And we were going to kind of talk about where do we go from here and that kind of stuff at the end of the podcast. And I was actually going to tell you, Caleb, I've come around to your side of this argument, it's time for Seth Luttrell to go. I was going to drop that bomb on you, uh, but I still didn't think it was going to happen in the season. I I really was sticking to my guns that nothing was going to change with this staff until the end of the season. And clearly, you know, that you you talked about, you know, Texas, if you thought a change was going to happen, it would happen after Texas. Here's the problem. The Tennessee game, that was a top 10 opponent. Texas was the number one team in the country. So you lose those games and you perform poorly while well, you're playing, you know, number six in the nation and number one in the nation. South Carolina came to Norman losing three of their last five games. 
they they limped into Norman and didn't just didn't just win, but they dominated Oklahoma on the with their defense. You go back to Jackson Arnold, something you and I had talked about. Once you make the switch to Michael Hawkins, you can't go back. Well, he went back. And I think, I mean, you just got to feel like that's the final straw. This was not a top 10 team. This wasn't even a nationally ranked team. And the SEC standings, they were they were below Oklahoma. This was the game. This was the game where Oklahoma fans were in complete and utter disbelief. And I think this was it. This, when, when Jackson Arnold comes into the game after Michael Hawkins was just atrocious on the first three possessions for Oklahoma, Jackson Arnold comes into the game. And I, I had a friend watching the game with me, and I said, that's it. Seth Luttrell's done. And I just – I didn't realize it was going to be the day after, but I fully came, if you will, to the dark side um, at that moment. But – this was it. I mean, that I believe USC, South Carolina, and the reinsertion of Jackson Arnold, that was it. I mean, th- to me, that was the moment that this thing ended with Seth Luttrell. Yeah, and unfortunately, I was busy this weekend. Um, I, I was at a camp this weekend. I knew I was going to miss most of the first quarter. But I was like, I'm going to get back just in time to watch the second, third, and fourth quarter. Should be good. I get done what I'm doing. I get back to our cabin. I pull up my phone. I pull up the game up, and it's 21 nothing. And I, I'm like, what's happening? And I open Twitter, and I see the full meltdown. Mm-hmm. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to have a close. This is the first time I didn't watch an OU game. And I can't remember. And it's not because I'm not. And it's not because I was like didn't want to watch it, but I was like I have more important things to do right now than watch this performance. And it's yeah. just embarrassing that it's come to that. I never thought I would say that as an Oklahoma fan, because I mean I watched the entire forty nine nothing Oklahoma game. I watched the entire what was it sixty three to fourteen LSU blowout. I've been in the stands, cold, wet, wanted to go home, and Oklahoma was losing. And I, I, it's, I've never not watched a game to its completion. Mm-hmm. And I just had no desire to watch this offense who has struggled since week two to continue to struggle. Yeah, and I think you can make an argument that they struggled out the gate. I mean, even week one, there were – there were signs that things weren't good with this offense. And, you know, I talked about South Carolina kind of being the final straw, but the reality is this is what swung me more than anything else. Jackson Arnold wasn't working. You go to Michael Hawkins. He gives you a little bit of spark at the end of the Tennessee game. You went on the road at Auburn. Michael Hawkins was awful against Texas. He was even worse against South Carolina. There is no identity to this team offensively. You're seven games into the season. You're eight weeks into the season because you had a bye. And, you know, you're you're almost two-thirds of the way through. After Ole Miss on Saturday, you'll be two-thirds of the way through. And there's no identity. There's nothing that this offense does well. Are they a passing offense? No. Are they a running offense? No. Are they a power offense? No. Are they a dink and dunk offense? No. What are they? They 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 don't know what they are. They don't know what the strongest position unit is on the offense. We know it's not the offensive line. We know it's it's not the tight ends. We know it's not the receivers. By the way, let me since I'm just admitting that I was wrong about Seth Latrell getting fired midseason. Let me just tell you that the week after I go to battle with you on the tight ends, they were they probably worst game of the season for the tight ends yesterday. Not just in the category of missed blocks, because I conceded that they these guys can't block, but Bauer Sharp was dropping passes left and right in that game against South Carolina. Terrible game for the tight ends. 
And I'm, and I'm like, dude, I, I went to bat for you. It's on the internet. It's on iHeartRadio. It's on TuneIn Radio. I mean, it's all over me saying, well, the only position unit that's consistently catching passes is the tight ends. And it's like, haha, we'll show you. So apparently I'm wrong on more than just Seth Latrell getting fired midseason. But do, do you agree that South Carolina losing that bad to an unranked team or performing that bad against an unranked team and then really having no identity. Was that it for, for Seth Luttrell? I mean, it, it clearly something had to happen after two weeks in a row. Now I've got something else. I've got another theory that I want to throw at you, but I, I I'm waiting until true or false, but there's something there's, I have another idea, but I can't get to that yet until true or false. So we'll definitely come back to it, but Give me your thoughts, identity, um, and and you know, and then and identity after eight weeks of football, and then swapping quarterbacks again. Yeah, I mean, you summed it up perfectly. It's this offense it has, has its struggles. It's had its flashes of good. It's had its more flashes of bad. There's zero creativity. I mean, we talked about it. I know we talked about it a lot on the last week's podcast two weeks to prepare for Texas Mm -hmm. and it looked like it was a two day game plan. It looked like Seth Lachelle was like, Oh, we have an off week. I'm going to go on a vacation. I'm going to take it easy. It, the play calling never got better. I understand that you have to beat them. You have to try to beat something into this defense, into defenses. Like, okay, this is what we're going to do. Stop us. Uh But it was no creativity to get there. There is no trick plays. I get this offense is terrible, but you got to throw something out there to get a spark, you yeah. know. And there, there was nothing. There was when this offense walked onto the field. The it was a home game. The energy got sucked out of the stadium. The energy got sucked out of the sideline. They just didn't look like they were having fun. They didn't look like they wanted to be out there. And yeah, losing thirty-five to nine to South Carolina is bad. Yeah, and I've seen all people like, "Oh, I thought Oklahoma was supposed to have an elite defense." Uh, I, I hate to break it to people, but the offense was really what set Oklahoma back. Our offense, who is one of the worst offenses in the country had more yards than South Carolina's offense. Isn't that crazy? I actually wrote about that after the game yesterday. Um, uh, let me just, since you're on that, let me, let me read to you what I wrote. I said, um, I, just a little segment in the article, I said, how bad was it? In short, it was really bad. So very bad. And then I said this, generationally bad. It was only the second time since 1999 that Oklahoma has lost consecutive home games I remember the last game they played in Norman was against Tennessee on the 21st of September. The only other time this happened was during the 2014 season when Oklahoma lost back to back to Kansas State and Baylor. And then I said this because you you just brought this up. Oklahoma outgained South Carolina in total offensive yardage, 291 to 254. On the defensive side of the ball, the, the Sooners held the Gamecocks to 3.7 yards per offensive play. They held South Carolina to a season low 74 rushing yards and 1.8 yards per carry. That's more than 100 yards below the season average for South Carolina, yet Oklahoma still lost by 26 points. That's how and, bad it was. And not only that, but you you t- talk about this Oklahoma defense. Take them out of the equation. South Carolina's offense never touches the field. Oklahoma loses 14 to nine. They yeah. scored more yeah. points for South Carolina. Oklahoma's offense scored more points for South Carolina than they did their own team. And yeah, I mean, it's an offense that scored 12 points of football in its last eight quarters. 12, 12 points in its last eight quarters of football. It's just, it's bad. It was, it's been bad. And I get, Joe John's at the helms now, and I'm not too sure 
how long he's going to last. I I don't think he's going to be the offensive coordinator next just time next year. I I think he's just kind of a hey stop the bleeding type of deal. Who knows? Maybe he comes out and we win out the rest of the season and we're singing the praise for Joe John. But I I just I think this is a one of the two has to go. Seth, you've kind of been the guy in charge. We're going to give Joe John the chance now. And and the reason why I think that is we look at this, you know, the offensive staff that's kind of moved around a little bit mm-hmm. was as Kevin Johns, right? Right. Kevin who, Johns, uh-huh. who is, was just an offensive analyst, is now the co offensive coordinator. I, I just feel like they, they're building another scapegoat to where, okay, you know, maybe Ole Miss. And then Missouri goes bad. You fire Joe John, and then you put Kevin Johns as offensive coordinator for the last couple of games. I, well, Ke- I just, I'm oh, sorry, go keep ahead. going. No, no, I, I was just gonna say, Joe John Finley was in the booth with Seth Luttrell on Saturday. Um, a lot of fans realized that and picked up on it. But what, what most people didn't understand, including myself was that Kevin Johns was also in the booth with Seth Luttrell on Saturday. He was? Okay. I see, I didn't know that. Um, and my thing is, if he's going to be the quarterback's coach, why? one thing I did see is Britton Venables had the iPad, and he was going over film with both quarterbacks. Why is a defensive-minded coach the one doing that? Well, because all of your coordinators are up in the box. But I, I mean, yeah, you got Seth Luttrell, Joe John Finley, and Kevin Johns up there. But why? Why do we need all three of those guys up well, there? Well, I think they're trying to figure life out, Caleb. I, I think it was a – I think it was like I, – I think – go back and, and watch. It's on YouTube. I'm sure you, it won't be hard to find. Listen to Seth Luttrell post-game interview. He knew. He knew he was done. And – I think it was a a moment of getting these guys up there to test some things out to kind of get that see if they could uh, add anything. Um, Kevin Johns on paper, you kind of look at this guy and you think, okay, well, um, he he played the position of quarterback in college. He was the most recently the offensive coordinator at Duke, but he's been around the game for for a long time. Um, including uh, he, I think he was an analyst at Texas, uh, but he's been, oh, here it is. He's been the coordinator at Indiana, Texas Tech, as well as Memphis and Western Michigan. But I think, I I don't have it all in front of me, but I think he did, um, I think he did something at the University of Texas. I could be wrong. Uh, But then here's the thing that, Here's the thing that caught my attention that really kind of made me go, hmm, I don't know. It's that he's been the guy. Seth Luttrell was the quarterback's coach, but apparently Johns has been the guy who's been working with the quarterbacks. So what it made me think is this. If Seth Luttrell's the quarterback's coach, but you've got an analyst who's been spending primary all of the time with the quarterbacks, Seth Luttrell probably doesn't know his quarterbacks as well as an offensive coordinator should. So here's what it says. It says, Johns is in his first season at Oklahoma and will now have a significant voice in the offense. While Luttrell uh, held the title of quarterbacks coach, Johns has also worked primarily with the team's quarterbacks this fall. So that's either good or that's bad. It's good if Johns knows the quarterbacks and Seth Luttrell didn't because Seth Luttrell's gone. But it's bad if Johns is the guy that's been grooming these quarterbacks for the awful play that we've seen through seven games. And really, well, maybe we'll know it at Mississippi. Maybe we won't. I don't know. But I, I think at best, at best, Joe John Finley – is fighting to retain a position on this staff, not fighting to remain re- retain the position as offensive coordinator. He's I, he, I, he wants to stay on, but I don't think he's. I don't think this is an audition. This is a get us through the season. I agree, and 
you know, that we were driving home and that's one thing my wife asked because we were, I was kind of preparing for the podcast and I was doing some research about it. And she asked me if I thought that if I was excited for Joe John to be the new offensive coordinator, I was like, no, not really. Cause he's been co-offensive coordinator. Mm -hmm. So he's had a say in the offense. The offense has been bad. And she was like, do you think he'll be on campus next year? And I said, if he is, it's just still as a tight ends coach. Right. Not as an offensive coordinator. But I, I just I, – I don't see him being on campus next year. Well, no, I can. I can because I, I, I think you, – you, I mean, I'm not going to get back into I, this debate. But, but I think there are guys that have earned the right – to kind of reset if the new offensive coordinator wants them. And That's Joe John's saying. been around. He's been around. He He's an alumni. He has the network. He's brought in. I mean, you, there are some, some high rated tight end recruits that are on this team that are young. And so I, I don't know that he's going to be gone, but I think that'll be up to the new offensive coordinator, I guess. That's what I'm saying. If you're, you know, whoever we hire walks in, they, they see DeMarco Murray. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, he's, he's produced a couple, couple backs that's in the NFL. He, he's recruited well this past couple of years. His running backs haven't looked the greatest, but they, they haven't looked bad. You look at Bill Beatenbo. Okay. He's put in a lot of NFL talent. He's had a really bad season, but he's proved that he's one of the best in the business. You look at Emma Jones, one of the younger guys. Has proved that he can recruit it a lot. His room is decimated with injuries. So maybe you keep him on. But then you look at the tight ends who, I mean, I know we've disagreed with how they've looked, but they haven't looked great. And that's, and you know, no matter who we get, they're going to want to bring someone along. No office coordinator is going to come without, without their guy. They're, they have their guys that they want. And that's the easy – I feel like that's the easiest position to really be able to bring somebody in at. That and quarterbacks coach because we don't have a quarterback coach. you, you got to have a quarterbacks well, coach, yeah. We guess we, yes, we have a quarterbacks coach now. But we like you said, we don't, you don't know if he's, if he's been the guy that who has been what – he, what, he, what has he been doing with the quarterbacks? That's, that's the thing right. you don't know. Yeah, well um... – it got interesting. It got interesting really, really fast. What a what a fun Sunday afternoon this turned out to be. Um, we, we've got more talk about offensive coordinator. Caleb and I are going to give you our top three list uh, as replacements for Seth Luttrell. Um, we are going to talk about Oklahoma and South Carolina. There was some good that came out of it. And then I'm also asking, I'm asking the true or false questions this week of Caleb. This is the Sooner Nation podcast. Thank you for hanging out with us. Oh, it's such a clutch off-season pickup, Dave. I was worried we'd bring back the same team. I meant those blackout motorized shades. Blinds.com made it crazy affordable to replace our old blinds. Hard to install? No, it's easy. I installed these and then got some from my mom. She talked to a design consultant for free and scheduled a professional measure and install. Hall of Fame son. They're the number one online retailer of custom window coverings in the world. Blinds.com is the GOAT. Shop Blinds.com right now and get up to 40% off select styles. Rules and restrictions may apply. Caleb, you look at offensive uh, performance for Oklahoma in the 35 to nine loss against um, against South Carolina, four turnovers. I mentioned during the opening segment, a lack of identity. I mean, everybody was bad. Everybody across the board was bad. But I think the other thing was um, nine quarterback sacks. It's the most an Oklahoma quarterback has ever been recorded being sacked. In a, in a game, in the history of this program. Nine quarterback sacks. Um, they they were literally making fun of Oklahoma's schemes on the broadcast because it was just a lot of slide protection. And they were talking about how, yeah, South Carolina has this figured out. you got to bring something new in now because they've got this figured out. Um, it, was, it was chest against checkers. You know, South Carolina's defensive coaches – we're playing chess. Seth Luttrell was playing checkers. 
Seth Luttrell is gone on Sunday afternoon. And now you got to figure out who's going to replace him. And you and I both kind of have our own little short list. Um, we've got our top three. And so here's what I want to do. Cause I, I like to do, I like drama. So we're going to start, uh, I've got mine ranked in order of preference, one, two, and three. Do you have that? Or do you just have three names? I have mine one, two, and three. Nice. Okay. So we're going to start at three and then we're going to wake our work our way up to number one. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Do you want to go first? I'll let you go first. Cause I think my third one, whoever number three, I feel like a lot of people are like, what? So I'll let you go first. And then I can drop my bombshell. Okay. So your your bomb is number three. Yeah. Do you want to go opposite direction then? Or are you okay to do it like this? I don't I, I'm okay with do do like okay. this. So my my number three guy is currently at Texas Tech, Zach Kitley. Um he's a you know, he's an air raid kind of guy, if if you will. Um he studied under Cliff Kingsbury. Texas Tech currently ranks number 18th in scoring offense, 38.7 points a game, and number 19 in total offense, 459.7 yards per game. Um, And, you know, Red Raiders are the typical Red Raiders. They're struggling defensively, but they're, I mean, they're, they're dropping some points on the scoreboards out there in Lubbock. And I know they just lost to Baylor, but, Zach Kitley is a guy that I think Brent Venables should give a look to because it keeps, if he wants to keep that air raid ID, uh, but also Kitley has got some really good inroads in the state of Texas in terms of recruiting. So that's my number three. My number three. Uh, I'm going to see if you can guess them. Do you need can a drum that? roll? Do you need a drum roll or something? Can oh, we, you want can, me to guess? We, yeah. Yeah. So he's a former head coach in the big 12. A former head coach in the Big 12. But he's yes. not a head coach right now? Not a head coach right now. Is he on staff anywhere right now? He's not on staff anywhere right now. Former head coach, not on staff. Um, Cliff Kingsbury. No, Cliff Kingsbury is on staff, isn't he? In he the is. NFL? Um, he is. He's uh, are you talking about? No, Gary Patterson's a defensive guy. Um, Kevin Sumlin. Nope. Was that West West Virginia that went to Houston? No, Dana Holgerson. <laughs> yeah. I don't see. He never. You're right. That's a bomb. He never would have popped up on my radar. But it's a it's a very intriguing, a very intriguing um choice because you look at what he did at Oklahoma state before he went to West Virginia and he did, he did really well uh, in Stillwater. He did really well in Morgantown. Now the defense, again, the defense was his downfall. He never Uh really filled a defense, but I think back to those Baker Mayfield, Kyler Murray, even Jalen hurts games. Yeah. West Virginia was scoring a lot of points. Yeah, um, I, that's and, that. I never, never was on my radar. I don't know that that would happen, but dang. And he's got some recruiting inroads in Texas because of his time at Houston. You're going to make me Google Dana Holgerson and find out what he's <laughs> doing right now. I didn't even think of him. You're see, right. I, I had him. I didn't. He. I didn't see him do anything this season. Um. Because that was a name I was like, I know he got let go from Houston. Uh, and I was kind of wanted to see what he was doing. And he, it doesn't say he's coaching here right now. Uh, but I, I, th- I think, you know, he's a great offensive mind. He doesn't have to worry about being the head coach. He can right. just keep his head down, work this offense. And like you said, he had it. He had a good offense at Oklahoma State. He had a good offense at West Virginia. He never really got the ball rolling at Houston. But I think he could be a a good sleeper pick, and that's why he's my number three. Mm -hmm. Well, and the thing is, is at Oklahoma State, you know, he refused to buy a house. He lived in a hotel. You knew Oklahoma State was a stopover. He He was looking to be a head coach somewhere. 
now that he's been the head coach at West Virginia, he's been the head coach at Houston. I mean, I don't think he would have that mentality again. I can that's, I, I'm going to be honest with you, man. I, I'm intrigued by that. Um, that's a better, that's a better, I think it maybe it's a better number three than what I got. Who, who do you have at number two? I have Mike Shanahan from Indiana. Okay. Um, you know, their offense right now is just. Yeah, ask Nebraska pretty, how they feel about it. They're they're averaging uh, 48.71 points a game, which I'm mm-hmm. like, can we just round that up to 49 points a game? They're averaging total offense uh, over 500 yards of total offense each game. So this is an offense who is, I mean, doing – and it's not like they're doing it at a power – a group of five school. It's right. a power four conference, and they're they're rolling. And like I said, ask Nebraska, you know, they're they're 7-0. Yeah. And that's – the reason why he's in my number two is – I just feel like that's the tall task. It'd be a pretty good reach to try to go and grab him. But I, I would, he's, he's definitely one out there that I'm like, he well, could, I mean, it, it is Indiana. I don't know if it's yeah. tall of a reach at all, but they're the number one scoring offense in the country. And you know, was it, they dropped half a hundred on Nebraska Saturday. So I think they, I, I think it was 49. I think it, it was 49. I, like thought, I thought they won like 56 to seven. I'll have to look that score up. Um, so I remember it looked very similar to the OU Nebraska score from a couple of years ago. And I was just, and I thought it was funny. Yeah, I had, yep. if, if I did it. You're right. It was 56, seven. Oh, okay. If, if I, if my list went out to four or five, Shanahan would probably be on it. I didn't have him in my top three. My number two is Ben Arbuckle from Washington state. And he may actually be my number one. The more I look into him, um, He's been he's been at Washington State for for two years, um, and I mean, the Cougars are lighting up the scoreboard. And um, in twenty twenty three, they ranked thirty fifth in total yards per game, uh, fourth in the passing yards for three hundred thirty six point eight. Um, Cam Ward was that guy who went on the transfer to to Miami, and you saw what he did for the Hurricanes. The Cougars right now they're tied for twentieth in total offense. Uh, 400, just under 460 yards per game. And they're 15th in scoring offense, just under 40 points per game. Here's why I like this guy. I think he may be the most gettable guy out there because he's at Washington State. The Pac-12 lost the realignment war. Regardless of who they bring in that conference for 2025 and 2026, that conference will never be what it was and they will always be a leg behind unless they can get the ACC to dismantle and move across the country and are things like that. That I mean, shenanigans happen, but the point of the matter is this is Washington state in a conference. That's not, you know, the power conference it used to be. He could get to the sec back to the power conference, get his name out there. He, he may be the guy he's been there for two seasons Usually successful coordinators are ready to move if they want to be a head coach or if they want to be uh, a coordinator at a higher level program. The problem is Ben Arbuckle may, may end up making himself into a pretty good head coach as well. So um, he's my number two. I I'm pretty confident we're going to have the same number one. Probably. Does it does it rhyme with um, go go offense? Does it rhyme with go go offense? It does not I, rhyme with go go offense, but it, it's involved with a go go offense. I couldn't think of something to rhyme with go go. So sorry. Uh, so uh, Brendan Marion from UNLV. Um, look, that this this is my number one guy. Uh, they lost Saluka. Um, because of NIL stuff and disagreements, but still losing their starting quarterback. I mean, they're still putting up 430 yards almost per game and almost 44 points. Um, he was uh, he was up for the Frank Broyles Award. He was at least nominated for that last year. Um, he he was from he's got he played at the University of Tulsa, and this is the guy. When I was thinking about Texas passing game. 
Uh, it, it was this guy. He he spent a season at Texas uh, as the passing game coordinator back in 2022. Um, I I mean. I, this is my guy. I mean, I I just I knew someone on my list that I was talking about tonight had had time at Texas, and and this is who it was. Yeah, he. I mean, and he has that UNLV uh, offense rolling, and I mean, even with their starting quarterback saying peace, they're still find themselves six and one, right? And in a in kind of a foot race for that a college football uh, berth, playoff berth. And I think it's really impressive what he has done. Not that, but what he's done, even with, you know, your high profile, the guy that you were excited to get from the portal, be like, I want more money. If, it, if it's, you know, oh, you, I was promised this money, but you weren't told. I don't know exactly the full story. Right. But he, he just jets out and, it's kind of just he. They haven't skipped a beat. I know they lost a game since then, but I mean they still have looked really, really impressive this season. But here's the thing, and I mean I feel like at this point all cards are on the table. Everything is an option. You don't know what happened with Saluka at UNLV. Who who promised him the money and who didn't pay the money, right? All mm-hmm. you know is he didn't get what he was asking for or what he was promised. So he's in the portal. If he still has a good relationship with Saluka, there's a there you you could get a a package deal with a coordinator and a quarterback, which is pretty much what they did with Dylan Gabriel. I mean Jeff Lebby and Dylan Gabriel, that that Dylan Gabriel was Jeff Lebby's guy. And when Jeff Levy was gone, Dylan Gabriel was gone. You you look at Jackson Arnold. I mean, he wasn't awful. 18 to 36 for 225 yards, and he threw a touchdown. Michael Hawkins, three of five for 18 yards, but he had the two interceptions and the fumble. I just you I think you look at this and you got, I mean, you got Oklahoma needs a quarterback. They got to have a quarterback, and Saluka is a baller. We, you and I, have they, already, you, we've already talked about. We don't expect both Hawkins and Arnold to be on campus next year. This is your package deal. I think this is your potential package deal. I I, I agree, especially with you know most likely both those guys aren't going to be on campus this time next year, and I'm hoping that it's not a situation where they both leave. And I feel like with Hawkins being pulled, that that could be the possibility that they both kind of jet out. And yeah, getting who knows if you know he has that relationship, comes over. Even if even if not that, you look at some. There's going to be some quarterbacks that hit the portal that's going to be pretty good. Right. And you're thinking, oh, he did this with. Matt Saluka, who again, not taking shots of Saluka, but kind of thinking, what can he do with me? Right. Since you stole my number one, I got a, I wouldn't have found a new number one for you. Oh, okay. And I don't know if you're gonna, gonna like it. As long as you don't say Lincoln Riley or Kel Gundy, we're all right. It's not Lincoln Riley. Oh, the no. last name is, and it's not Kel Gundy. Oh, okay. But the last name is Riley. I don't think he's leaving Clemson. I really I don't. don't either, but just kind of a who we would like to get. I think Garrett Riley would be fantastic. He's that offense at Clemson is rolling. Mm-hmm. We saw what he did at TCU. You know what's going to happen with Debo? Not Debo. Dabo. Who's there? Dabo. Sorry, Debo Samuel was the. Receiver for the uh, 49ers, Dabo, but you know, he's kind of been a hot mess a couple years with not wanting to change up how they play. Right. And this is definitely going to be a season where they need to hit the portal. So it's something where Garrett Riley's like, yeah, I kind of want to try to test my waters, see if we can get money, more money somewhere else. I don't think we go after him, no. but I think I would like to see that. 
I Since think, you stole my number one, I just had to throw out another number one. Well, we could have agreed on the same number one. I just we could have. I don't. I think Garrett Riley's next stop is as a head coach. That's what I think. I agree. Hey, maybe we fire Brent Venables to get him as a head coach. <laughs> stop. Did you see the buyout? It's like $45 million. No. People yeah. are really talking about his buyout. Yeah, yeah. And and it's not going to happen. But I, I don't want to talk about that just, that just yet because of what's coming up. Speaking of coming up, there was some good on Saturday for Oklahoma against South Carolina. And we've got true or false. This is the Sooner Nation podcast. I know we've had all the drama of the offensive coaching changes for Sunday afternoon, but Oklahoma did play a game on Saturday and uh, it was for the most part bad, but there was some good that I want us to get into. um, And we're going to talk about that, but Caleb, I I do want to ask you, um, I want to ask you about the coaching changes. Is it, is it too far gone? Like, is it, um, w- when you look at how bad it's been, you look at Joe John Finley and the fan base immediately doesn't trust him. I mean, is, is it is it salvageable when you look at the player personnel and you look at Joe John Finley? I want to say yes, but I, I don't believe so. Now, we don't know what the locker rooms were like. I mean, again, I, I said after the, the OU Texas game, I don't think a lot of OU players liked Seth Luttrell. I mean, you don't just go get smoked by your rival and then not say a single word after after that loss mm-hmm. if um, if you feel confident with those in the locker room. Could be completely different. These guys might just want to rally around Joe John a little bit more than Seth Luttrell. These guys might have a little more faith and confidence in Joe John than they did with Seth Luttrell. So it's possible, but I, I just, I don't think so. Well, I want you to hang on to what you just said, because that's going to come back around um, in this, in this podcast, Oklahoma um, 19 first downs in the game. Six of 19 on third down, one of five on fourth down, 291 total yards. I remember, I remember that was one of your your over-under questions for me was would they break the 300-yard mark? I took the under and barely made that. 238 of those yards came through the air. Um, they um, – 53 rushing attempts. I'm oh, sorry, sorry, 53 rushing yards on 41 attempts, 1.3 yards per carry four turnovers nine quarterback sacks they only three penalties only three penalties for 27 yards i think if you're if you need the glass to be half full then i've got a couple of things and i want to throw these at you and you tell me are these really things that they yeah okay there was some good or is it just no, that's just burn this film. We got a new offensive coordinator calling plays on Saturday, and let's put this behind us and move on. But I, I want to do this. Oklahoma tied its season high with six quarterback sacks, and they also had 11 tackles for loss. Is that is that worth – I mean, is that – can you say that was something good on a very bad day? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it goes back to that – Feeling after oh the Tennessee game, mm-hmm. you know you a ten point loss twenty five to fifteen. It felt like it was right there. Oh, you right. could have had it. The offense could have got a little better. You go to next week, go to Auburn. Defense steps up, pick six. They win that game. You go to that first really twenty eight. 25 minutes of the OU Texas game. It's seven to three. And this defense is playing lights out. Mm-hmm. But then you got to throw in the offense. Go to OU Texas, two straight fumbles in a row. Go to the first quarter of the Tennessee game, uh, the South Carolina game. First drive, interception. Next drive, scoop and score. Next drive, Pick six. 
if this offense can just be something that doesn't continue to just shoot themselves in the foot, this defense is good enough to win you games. Yeah. And I've proven that week in and week out. So, yeah, six sacks, 11 tackles for loss is something to, like, look at. Something to kind of, like, no, at least this defense is playing and continuing to play. Mm -hmm. They could have jumped ship after the Tennessee game. They could have jumped ship after the Auburn game. But, yeah, here they are week in, week out, being one of the best units in college football. Yeah, and – and it's not just the six sacks and the 11 tackles for loss. Oklahoma held South Carolina to six for 18 on third down, 33 point, uh, 33% com, uh, conversion. Um, and then we already mentioned earlier in the podcast, a season low 74 rushing yards, 1.8 yards per attempt, which is uh, you know more than 100 below their season average. They're averaging 175.3. And you and I talked in the pregame that that was going to need to be a target goal of the defense was to come in and to shut down South Carolina's running attack. And if they did that, then they would be in a position to, to have a chance to win the game. You just didn't know the offense was going to implode the way it did. Um, I'm going to mention two guys. Uh, Danny Stutzman was a monster. Did you see the box score? Yeah, he had like, what, 15, 16 tackles? 16 tackles. And do you know that's only like the third highest amount? Like that's not even the top two uh, for his career in a game, which is which is crazy. Um, so Denny Stutzman all over the place, which is, again, a guy we called out that he needed to be all over the place in order to stop the running game of South Carolina. And then you've got Jacob Jordan, six catches, 86 yards. All I mean that he he's got six catches and eighty six yards on the season, and they all came against South Carolina, averaging fourteen point three yards per catch. A kid out of South for true freshman out of South Lake Texas. Um, somewhere you got some hope with the right wide receiver position. Yeah, and I know this is going to sound bad, but I mean, what version of a white kid walk on are we going to get? You know, are we going to get the Drake Stoops who? He's going to be turned into a reliable receiver. Or are we going to get, I mean, I don't want to throw shots, but I'm going to do it. Are we going yeah. to get with Gavin Freeman? I knew, who, I knew you. I knew exactly where you were going. Who looked promising his first couple touches as a, as a sooner. And then just kind of became a liability. Yeah. Um, He definitely looked, I mean, he looked good on Saturday mm -hmm. from the highlights I've seen. Um, and he's definitely a name that we haven't heard from. And he's definitely kind of when this receiver room, you know, we talked about next man up, who's going to be the next man. Yeah. And this walk on's like me, please pick me. So I, I'm in, I'm excited to see if he can become something. I mean, you got to have a receiver who can make plays and it's been a while since you had that. And, um, of course, then you got the the, the bomb uh, for uh, for Brendan Thompson, and and that was good. Um, I mean, you got something out of that position on Saturday, uh, which was much needed. Uh, you know, the big question is, you, you you look at that box score, thirty five to nine, and and like you said, if you didn't watch the game, if you just looked at the box score, um, you're gonna think, man, that defense just got demolished. But twenty one points were set up um, by Oklahoma's offense. You you went through that those first three drives earlier in your in, in your conversation, but the reality is, you got you had the big quarter against Texas where the Longhorns scored twenty one, then you got the big quarter against USC where the where the Gamecocks scored twenty one. You take away both of those moments, and you can't. I mean, I I get it that you can't, but if you could, you're you're very competitive in those games if you could get something from the offense. And so you look at this and you think, well, how did it get so bad? How, how did Oklahoma get blown out by a team that's struggling in conference play? Well, first of all, you got to realize the Sooners also struggling uh, in conference play. But this is a team that's in Oklahoma. They thrived. Caleb, they have thrived on turnovers. And they didn't, they didn't register a single turnover on Saturday. And it broke a streak of 12 consecutive games without at least one turnover. 
And the last time Oklahoma won a game without forcing a turnover was October 21st of last season against UCF, a game they almost lost. And you go into Saturday's game, they ranked second nationally with 43 interceptions since the start of the 2022 season. And what they didn't do was they didn't get any turnovers. But what they did do is they turned the ball over four times. And you were you go into the weekend plus seven turnover margin. Now you're plus three. And and I think you you look at that, and that that was a huge, huge factor in this game. Yeah, definitely. Um and not only that, but I one thing that I looking at the box score that really kind of caught my eye is six fumbles. Yeah. I know we only think, I think we only lost two of those. Right. You like had six, two interceptions and two fumbles that were lost. Six fumbles. Right. It's still just terrible. And you talk about just how bad it is. Coughing up the ball six times is bad. I get that we, we we recovered it four times. Good for us, but six times you're dropping the ball. It's just terrible. No, and and it gets worse. I mean, it gets worse because you've got the you've got the lack of turn uh, lack of gaining turnovers. You're giving it away four times, and then well, like we mentioned earlier, you've got you've got the nine quarterback sacks. Your quarterback was taken to the ground nine times. That is a program record. Do you do you know how difficult it is to run an offensive scheme when your team is getting blown up in the backfield? I mean, it's 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 literally impossible. Mm-hmm. And and so in all in all in, in total, South Carolina made thirteen plays behind the line of scrimmage against Oklahoma's offense. And so I, I'm the reason I'm bringing this up because we have spent the most of this podcast basically crucifying Seth Luttrell. And I would say deservedly so. We, we talk about the lack of identity. We talk about the lack of motivation. We talk about all of that. But there is also a large portion of this failure that belongs to the team. And, and no one is exempt, in my opinion. Maybe Seth Luttrell's the first domino. But you've got players that can't play, players that don't know their assignment, players that um that are not ready. You got, I mean, it just it's it is a debacle that ultimately falls on the shoulders of the coordinator, and that coordinator's been removed. But there is blame to go around with the players, is there not? Oh, 100%. I mean, look at the six fumbles alone. I mean, yeah, a coach can coach all you want, but keep it mm-hmm. protecting the ball. It ultimately falls on the player. Right. It's just, just the performance Saturday was just awful. I, I get we can try to sprinkle in a little bit good with Jacob Jordan on the offense. We're like, oh, look at this possibility. But there wasn't really a just big flashing positive t- to take away. Right. You know, after the loss to Tennessee, you have, okay, well, it's Hawkins. It's a Hawkins show. We can tell that, that experiment failed. I'm not saying Hawkins is a bad quarterback. I think he's going to have a great college career. I think Jackson Arnold's going to have a great college career. It's just something's not clicking. And I think, you, again, you start with the offensive coordinator and then you work your way down. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and we'll see. I mean, I, I think everybody, uh, there's a big board up somewhere that's got everyone's name on it. And the first name has been erased from that board, which was Seth Luttrell. But there's other names up there. And when we talked about Michael Hawkins uh, maybe being in the, in the transfer portal, Jackson Arnold maybe being in the transfer portal, there's probably some guys that are going to be encouraged to go to the transfer portal 
based off of the way they've performed, are not even been able to play this year. We got more coming up. Uh, we're going to close out this episode of the Sooner Nation podcast with sure or false. I'm asking the questions uh, this week. G- Caleb, I bet you can't guess the topic. Okay, true or false, here's how it works. I'm going to throw out five statements. Caleb, you're going to tell me whether they are true or whether they're false and the reason why. And some of these I've been holding on to um, just because I wanted to talk about them a a little bit. Uh, So obviously you get to lead this conversation based off of your opinion, but I've been holding some quotes from Brent Venables back and maybe a couple of thoughts, okay? All right. All right, here we go. Uh, I've got five for you. Uh, we're going to start with the very first one. True or false? Replacing Seth Luttrell was the right move, but it won't pay immediate dividends in terms of the team's performance for the remainder of the season. I think true. Um, I just I I don't have confidence in this Oklahoma offense. Mm-hmm. The starter, my main thing was Seth Luttrell. I think there could be a possibility of a spark with Joe John, but I think it was a step in the right direction, but I think we won't really see changes until we get the next offensive coordinator in. Right. In Norman. Yeah. I think here's my thing, Uh, you know, play calling. You've been saying it since day one, basically play calling was an issue, but so was execution. And those two, maybe they go hand in hand, maybe they don't. But here's what I know. I know coaches don't miss blocks. I know coaches don't fumble the football. I know coaches don't drop the ball when it hits them in the hands. And I know coaches don't throw interceptions. Those are all things that are that are happening on this offense. And so you can have a guy call different plays, but you're still going to have those issues. So, um That's just my two cents. All right, here we go. Number two, true or false, the next offensive coordinator cannot have any ties to the Oklahoma football program. True. I was trying to think if there's any big names I can think of that I was like, yeah, they can come on in, but. Well, I'm talking about even guys like you can't promote Joe John Finley. You can't promote anybody. Yeah. Anybody that's on this staff right now cannot be promoted to the offensive coordinator. And you can't go out and get somebody if they're out there that you can bring back. Yeah, I, I think I'm true. You know, it's it was a good experiment. I, I get where Brent Venable's head was at. You know, he hires Jeff Levy. Levy has a good season. Offensive coordinators are kind of like the new – hot head coach right now. Mm-hmm. So they're going to be flying off the shelves left and right. So you go get somebody like Seth Luttrell and Joe John, who both OU players have OU ties, hoping that they can lock it down. But it was a big swing and a miss. There was a huge swing and a miss. So you got to go get someone who's proven right. that they are capable of being an offensive coordinator. And Yeah, yeah I, I mean, you – you're one and one Brent Venables and offensive coordinators, you know, Jeff Levy had ties to the program and he was a hit. Um, And I think Oklahoma fans didn't realize how much of a hit he was until you see the Seth Luttrell offense. But again, Jeff Levy ties to the program. He was a hit Seth Luttrell, Joe John Finley ties to the program. Like you said, absolute miss. The next guy can't have ties to the program. That's just my, my, my take on this, but please continue your thought on that. I mean, I was just going to follow it up with Levy had ties, in, but he also was proven. You know, right. he kind of proved himself at Old Miss before he jumped yeah. on board with the Sooners. Right. But, yeah, I, I agree. You can't really pr- promote within. I think the worst case scenario is you promote Kevin Johns, the offensive coordinator, and then that, after like, that decision is going to be the – the last domino for Brent Venables, you mm-hmm. have to go get a guy like any of those six guys we talked about to come in and run this offense. Yeah. 
Um, it's interesting that you said what you just said about Brent Venables because the next question or the next statement is this. Even after making this move to fire Seth Luttrell, Brent Venables is going to go into the 2025 football season on the hot seat. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it pains me to say because he hasn't been a terrible head coach, but that decision really kind of makes makes up for the lack of – makes up for it, – it makes or breaks it. Mm-hmm. You – because it wasn't like there wasn't offensive coordinators we could have gone after. Right. I mean, you look at Chip Kelly at Ohio State. Um, who's at Arizona? Not Arizona, Arkansas. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm blanking on the name as well, but I, I know what you're talking. I know what you're saying. But you had a lot of guys that were in between jobs, mm-hmm. and you don't even open the search up. It was as soon as Levy leaves, you self promote. You don't go get a real quarterbacks coach, and as the head coach, that falls on him. And so, Bobby Petrino. Bobby, yeah, thank you. I, I Google. I gotta be honest with you. I googled it. <laughs> so yeah, it he's definitely coming in on the hot seat mm-hmm. because not because of his ability to coach the defense, but his ability to be a head coach. He's a great defensive coordinator. He's a great defensive mind. He's proven that at both the University of Oklahoma as a defensive coordinator, at the University of Clemson as a defensive coordinator, mm-hmm. and as a head coach at the University of Oklahoma. But the one thing he hasn't done well is make those big decisions. And so, yeah, it, this next hire is going to be huge because if you go and swing and miss again, right? You're. it looks like he might be fired from the University of Oklahoma. Well, let's, um, let's stick with that, okay? Brent Venable's status at the University of Oklahoma – May or may not, sorry, I can't read my notes. <laughs> True or false, Brent Venable's status as a coach on the hot seat at the University of Oklahoma may result in some of these big names turning down the position. I think false. Um, I think some of these big names are looking at, you know, hey, I come in, I ball out. I show that I'm a good coach. He mm. gets kicked to the curb. Why not me as the next head coach at, at Oklahoma? If he okay. doesn't work out, why not me? Okay. And even if it's a, okay, I come in, Britton Venable gets let go, it's still the University of Oklahoma. It's still going to be an attractive job to coaches. Okay. I, I can't argue with that. Um, I got one more and then a bonus. Here's the last official one. True or false? Ultimately, Seth Luttrell lost the locker room. 100% true. And I think you go back to, I mean, he 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 knew he lost the locker room after that Texas game. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it was before the Texas game, during or after, but he knew he lost the locker room, and that's why he didn't go speak to them. And that's why that was such a big issue to me is because the offense, offensive performance we got Saturday directly shows that they they didn't trust Seth Luttrell. They didn't care about his future. They didn't want him there. And I'm not saying that Hawkins went out there and – through two interceptions and fumbles on purpose. But he's playing, I got to do what's best for me. So he's trying to force plays. He doesn't have faith in the guy in his ear. He mm-hmm. doesn't have faith on the, in the guys on the sideline. And it's because Seth Luttrell lost the locker room. I I think I agree with you. And um, I think Brent Venables kind of hinted at that. I don't know if you saw his comment 
on Sunday evening um, when, when the announcement was made, but he talked about Joe John and he says this, the leadership role Joe John plays on our team is critical. He, and listen to this part. He has the confidence of our locker room and coaching staff. And then he goes on to say, and I'm thankful for him. I'm thankful to him for taking on this expanded role in the middle of the season. But it's, it was interesting to me that Brent mentioned that Joe John has both the confidence of the locker room and the coaching staff. And I don't, I mean, maybe we're reading between the lines, but it just doesn't sound like Seth was a part of a team that believed in him, but they believe in Joe John. And so now what we've got to find out is, is there a response to that? Do some of these guys suddenly get healed up and they're able to come back and play? Or do they suddenly remember how to block? Do they suddenly remember how, which gap to run through? I think if you're Joe John, it's simplify, simplify, simplify. And then you're on the phone with Brent Venables to all of these offensive recruits. That's that's what he's got to do in the next five days, right? Yeah. And not only that, but he's got to sit down both Hawkins and Arnold and be like, hey, what, what do y'all need from me? Mm-hmm. How can I make your guys' life easier? Because – do you know who's going to be the quarterback Saturday? Right. Nobody does. <laughs> I don't I think, think Joe. I, I think it's got to be Jackson Arnold at this point, to be honest with you. I, 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 th- I think I, I agree with you, but I don't think anybody knows. I don't think Joe John knows. So you sit down the, these two guys like, hey, what plays can I call to make you feel the most confidence? And then after that, it's a whole offensive meeting like, hey, I think back to the uh, the movie uh, We Are Marshall, where <laughs> don't laugh at me, but where Matthew McConaughey's like none of this works, erases everything off the chalkboard, is like, and he says simplify, simplify, simplify. Well, what that's why I was simple- laughing because that's exactly <laughs> what I just said. But you were, you didn't quote the movie, okay? <laughs> okay. Give me a break. But. And you sit down and you ask your offense, hey, what plays are you noticing having more success than others? Mm-hmm. How can we build off of that? And how can we turn this thing? Because, I mean, I get that the offensive players are going to be like, oh, yeah, we suck. Right. But they, they see the plays to be made. They know there's plays out there. Joe John just has to be like, hey, how do we unlock those? Right. What do I need to do as your coordinator, as your play caller? to get us to those points. Yeah. I mean, he's got his work cut out for him, which brings me to this bonus question I've got for you. Um, We'll wrap up with this true or false. There's still five games left on the season, but it's over. As much as it pains me to say, I think it's true Mm -hmm. because I mean, you look who who are you going to beat? You gonna go on the road to LSU? You gonna go on the road to Ole Miss? I get that Alabama and Missouri haven't looked good, but are are you gonna have the confidence in that offense to do something? Right. No, hey, if this offense comes out Saturday and they put up, you know, they look like oh yeah, okay, they put up twenty one points, you know, and we lose thirty one twenty one. Then yeah, hey, this season we can still we can go. There's still two more wins we can get to go bowling. Mm-hmm. But I I just I don't see Joe John be able to turn around this offense in this short of time. Now this is this time last week, right? Then yeah, maybe I'm giving Joe John a little bit more benefit of a doubt. He's got a couple. He's got a a game against South Carolina to kind of. Okay, let's let's tune up. Let's try to figure out what works, what don't work. But now he's got to figure out what works, what doesn't work against Ole Miss on the road. Yeah, yeah. I mean, hindsight hindsight's twenty twenty. But this is a decision. If it was going to happen, it should have happened before Texas when you had the bye week. I agree. And I think you know, even even after Texas and after the bye week, 
still should have happened then. Yeah. Yep. All right. Well, that's it for this episode of the Sooner Nation podcast. He's Caleb. I'm Matt. Caleb, as typical, you were amazing. Thanks for your conversation. Uh, we've got stuff at the website, heartland-sports.com. Thunder basketball is coming up. Uh, of course, Oklahoma, the football season's not technically over. They do play uh, in the state of Mississippi against Lane Kiffin and those Rebels. Um, we got that uh, on the website this week. And then we'll we'll be back later on with our pregame podcast. And we probably won't know who's going to play quarterback for Oklahoma by then. But we'll certainly have something to talk about on that episode. So having a great week. Enjoy it. And uh, Boomer Sooner, everybody. Bye.